Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, as you know, if you've been watching uh, the channel for a long time, the New Culture Forum was based on the idea that we should challenge orthodoxies wherever they are in the academic world, in the publishing world, in the media, and indeed in the political world. So I'm um, delighted to see a new publishing imprint which has started called Forum, whose sole aim, in fact, is to publish people who don't necessarily fit into these orthodoxies. And uh, it's been, the man behind it uh, is with me now, my guest this week, George Owers. Uh, George, thank you very much for joining us. First of all, I should say Forum. It's called Forum. Yeah. Uh, it's just started, no connection to New Culture Forum, I might add. What is the aim? Well, I think that we see um, that, I mean, it's not just in publishing, it's in all kinds of areas, as you kind of alluded to, but publishing is as good an example as any, that um, the views represented by the people who run it and therefore the things that they produce are a very narrow range generally. <coughs> they tend to be restricted to people of broadly, I don't know what you'd call it, kind of progressive left, liberal left kind of um, attitude. And uh, authors that don't fit into this very easily on all kinds of grounds, I mean, not just people on the right but people who are kind of awkward leftists who have kind of fallen foul of their own side what you might call kind of enlightenment liberals who are rather aghast at some of the things that are going on in terms of the, the kind of extremities of id politics and so on um are increasingly finding that they're you know if they have a publisher their publishers are getting a bit antsy about retaining them um or you know often they've struggled to get published in the first place and you know we're there to try to you know sign the people who are you know original voices who have something genuinely interesting and rigorous to say but who you know are currently shut out from that culture um you know where the publishing is dominated by a relatively small number yeah. of large companies and you know i mean i would say that historically there has always been uh, publishing has always had a kind of liberal left bias for many decades. It's not a, a new thing. But what has changed or is increasingly changing is that the big presses um, used to, you know, they were liberals, more emphasis on the liberal part of that. And they were quite willing to publish, you know, a wider range of voices, conservatives, uh, right wingers. Uh, you know, mavericks of all kinds, mm. and increasingly a culture that you only put you you know certain areas, quite large swathes of public debate are kind of out of bounds, and and you get kind of for example a lot of younger people who work in publishing who are very kind of censorious. They don't like the idea of publishing people who. You know, basically they don't agree with, they strongly disagree with, and so it's becoming the monoculture of publishing is becoming more and more of a problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I wonder why it is. It does seem to be particularly publishing, actually. I mean, you know, as you say, it's always been what I would call sort of traditionally Hampstead left, if you like. Uh, whereas now it seems to be one of the most restrictive areas. I wonder why it attracts, as you mentioned, those young people who particularly don't like publishing things they don't agree with. That's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the people who go into publishing are overwhelmingly arts, social science graduates yeah. from universities. And I, mean, I think you've seen a general trend whereby younger people, graduates in those kind of areas, are, you know, so, so, so partly it's kind of a problem for universities as much as anything, if you trace it back, who are used to not being challenged to, uh, you know, academia is in many cases more of a kind of activist uh, enterprise more than it is a you know a kind of critical learning d debate and so on kind of enterprise as, as it should be and I suppose I mean I would say I suppose that the people I mean publishing is not renowned through its high wages uh, and it's you know it's it's a kind of thing that you that, that are quite clever people who've been to university go to and they you know the the, the, the immediate rewards are obviously quite limited and I think yeah. that they're, they're that that breed of younger radicalized people who who are kind of I mean you might almost say that they're kind of the product of elite over um, um, elite overproduction they are, are think that, you know they find themselves quite you know not doing that well in the social economic structure um, but they have very big ambitions and they've been very well educated and you know, those kind of people were the, the the people who were like the most um, the, the most vocal Corbynites for example and it's the same kind of like social group, age and demographic and educational group that that fueled Corbynism. Mm. And, you know, younger people in publishing tend to be very much from that, that area. Um, I mean, that said, I don't, if the problem is not just young people in publishing, um, 
uh, it's also the fact that I think the bigger problem is the spinal, you know, often the kind of relative spinelessness of the more senior people who should know better, really, mm. um, who are afraid of, you know, they're afraid of backlash on social media. They're afraid. I mean, my, my personal theory is that a lot of them is more about the fact that they they don't want to be kind of alienated amongst their peer group. They don't, they, you mm. know, they, it's kind of, you know, they don't want people. Um, giving them funny looks at dinner parties in Islington and and and, and so on. Um, but you know, that said, I mean, I, obviously this is all this is the case, and we want to provide a new outlet for this. But you know, I it should I want to make it more more positive than just all oh, the publishing industry is terrible. You know, the publishing industry has good still has good people. It still has good editors at other 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 firms, though they're increasingly finding it difficult. They're finding, um, you know, I mean, I won't. I don't think it's really good form to mention names but I know of a number of incidents where people have good editors have been basically have had their projects stopped by senior management who've got very uh, kind of um, un un you know the, the, the first sign of any backlash they get very um, um, nervous about it and they can't and, and then and then so then and this process is getting worse and I think the, the good editors in some of the bigger presses are increasingly finding uh, the atmosphere constrained and difficult um, um, but yeah, well, I want to also I want to emphasise that you know, we want to be positive. We want to publish original, new thinkers. You know, really important ideas in a positive way to contribute positively to the debate, rather than just slagging off the rest of the publishing industry. You know, I, I remember actually. Similarly, I'm not mentioning names, but I, I spoke to a publisher last year, quite a, quite a, from a big publishing house, and um, he very much uh, wanted to try to span out and to to widen things. But it was so timid and it was almost sort of like, it was almost a bit along the lines of we want to prove that you don't have to be bad to write this. You know, if you've written a book that says this or that, it doesn't mean you're bad. But it was terribly apologetic. So consequently, I don't think anything's happened. No, you know, I, I think it has a lot to do with, with status, personally. I think mm -hmm. that certain opinions... <laughs> And certain political viewpoints are seen as very low status, as very kind mm. of... Uh, it's a lot of snobbery involved, I think. That well, pre Brexit. Brexit is a, the obvious example. Um, you know, the tendency to categorise anybody who voted Leave as some kind of, you know, idiot from the sticks who, you know, is, is probably you know, has no education, is stupid, or, you know, it's very patronising. Um, and therefore, you know, publishing anything which, you know, deviates from the kind of normal, polite consensus is seen as being you know, terribly, you know, declassé, darling, you know, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, and, and I think it's, it's silly. It's, it's, it's a very silly, silly attitude because, you, you know, any culture which ends up so dominated by a small number of opinions becomes, you know, infested with groupthink. And that's never, it's not a healthy thing for a wider culture. You need to, um, you know, uh, orthodox used to be challenged so that you can, even if, you know, if, if, even if you want them to be strengthened, you need them to be challenged. I mean, you know, a, what is it? A, a cloistered and fugitive virtue, you know, as yeah. Milton talked about, is not, you know, it's not worth, it's not worth anything. It, um, so, you know, and I think it reveals a weird kind of lack of security because if you're very confident in your ideas, then you'd welcome scrutiny and you'd welcome alternative mm. voices. Mm. Um, there's no reason to shy away from it. Um, so, you know, let's let's you know, bring it on as well. <laughs> so, with that with that in mind, we're looking to the future. I mean. You have how? What have you? What have, what have you already published? I suppose you haven't you haven't published anything yet, have you? Or if you're, you've been well, the, so the first book to publish in the forum imprint is um, "Woke Racism" by John McWhorter, which is a book. Oh, right, we that's bought, the American. We bought yeah, we bought the rights from the UK rights for that, and um, so that's not a book that we've actually commissioned from scratch. But uh, and that obviously addresses the kind of the US um, context, but you know it's very relevant to those kind of racial debates that are very much becoming current in Britain. But, um, I mean, what I, is, sorry, what is the woke racism? I know John McWhorter in the book, but just for people who necessarily haven't heard of it, it is basically, what is his basic premise in that book? Well, his basic argument is that actually the, the kind of premises of, of a lot of you know, progressive left um, attitudes towards race in America reveal, I suppose, what you'd call a kind of racism of low expectations. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's the kind of patronising um, approach, which actually doesn't help hasn't actually helped um, African Americans. I mean, a lot of the you know kind of programs, attempts to you know engineer social engineering, positive discrimination, all these things that mean they're actually they can be done and, and also lowering standards mm. like lower there's an argument that i mean it more extreme and there's a, there's an argument that you know things like liter good good written english literacy are you know white 
constructs and therefore you should lower standards in order to widen access to and of course the obvious repost from someone like John McWhorter who is a highly educated black man is well we don't need the standards lowered we're perfectly capable you know it, 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 it's almost saying that you know uh, that it sort of is it's a kind of reverse racism yes, um, yes. Um, you know you're saying that basically the, 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 they're saying that the, the black people are, 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 can't be expected to reach the stand you know good standards of you know in, in things that are fairly objective like you know literacy numeracy you know, mm. educational standards in general and, and 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 i think that clearly applies to britain but we you know um so we that's the first book we've pub we've published but i mean we've got quite a few people signed up so um i mean are you expecting i i for years the ncf you know if i had a dollar for every aspiring author who said oh i can't i won't get published with this i won't get published with that i mean are you expecting I would have thought you would have quite a market of people mm. who pretty much have given up the whole idea of trying to get published. I mean, not because they're so outrageous, but because, you know, the whole tenor of the times is such that they just don't even bother. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also, it, it's, <laughs> it's people who are, I suppose, broadly speaking, in various respects on the right. Um, uh, but it's also like people who are kind of mavericks on the left. Um, you know, so for example, I worked for another press before I, I, I came to set, to help set up Forum, and um, I worked for Polity Press, and I, I published Paul Emery's book there, for example. If you're Paul Emery's book was despised, despised was it, uh, yeah, about yeah. the white working class. Yeah, yeah why the modern left hates the white working class, and um, you know, and Paul is no doubt, as undoubtedly a left winger by any sane standards. Like, the, I mean, in terms of economic, social democratic kind of policies and so on, he you know he is very much a man of the left. Um, but because he, you know, he's quite critical of a number of kind of the, the kind of progressive left package on particular on cultural politics as it's become, you know, he, he's been often attacked for being you know, a right winger or even among the more kind of outlandish realms of social media. They were, you know, he'd be accused of being a, a fascist, a red brown fascist or, and, and things like that. And, you know, and, and, I'm, and I don't I don't want Forum to just publish. I don't want us to become as narrow by just publishing, you know, people of another narrow band mm. of views. I, my, my challenge would be, you know, the left used to believe in free speech because, in fact, they used to be the, the, the progenitors of, of arguments for free speech because for very, for, for very good reason, because they appreciate that when you're in a, an unpopular position or you're in a minority, then you need the protection of free speech more than anybody. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, I would say that, you know, we want to publish left wing people if they've got something genuinely interesting and original to say that isn't just kind of reheating you know, kind of what we've all become very familiar with um, in kind of current arguments. You know, if they, if they want to challenge, you know, an, uh, uh, to challenge their own kind of natural audience's preconceptions and they want to make an argument which they think will, you know, fall outside the boundaries of what's become a very attenuated view of left-wing progressivism, then come to us because we'd love to publish them. And, I, you know, I, I'm, I would love to, I, you know, Paul's book did very well for us, you know, in my last, in my last job and there's a real market for it. And what, what was very interesting about Paul's book was the fact that, um, you know, one of the things I really wanted to do, I wanted to publish books that that um, are read by people who are not just from a very narrow social range, right? Mm. Most of the books I was doing in polity, I mean, it's not really a criticism of polity, it's, it's just the nature of the beast, were read by, you know, the people, the same kind of people, Guardian readers, people who, you know, read mm. broadsheet newspapers, who probably are disproportionately likely to live in London or the home counties. But when we published Paul's book, we were getting lots of messages on social media and so on by people who were, you know, who probably don't read many, haven't read many books in recent years, partly probably because they don't, they don't there aren't many books published that they're particularly interested in um and you know ordinary people from you know the provinces from you know brexit voters working class people who were writing to us and saying things like paul this is like i haven't read a book this good in years are you finally mm -hmm. speaking to us in a way you know and and, and they really appreciate it. and i really like that because i just don't want to just be publishing books that are bought by you know graduates who live in north london i want you know we want to be speaking to the whole country did 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 so did Paul's book sell quite well? Yes, it did very well. It was one of the best policies bestsellers the year it was published. Yeah. Um, you know, it really hit a nerve, I think. Because this is the point, I mean, I'm very pleased to hear that because this is the point, is that also the other side of the coin, if one's going to look at it from the, they said, people say, uh, <clears throat> oh, what are you complaining about? I mean, you know, you've got J.K. Rowling, who's, uh, you know, been very, you know, uh, forthright in about what she says about trans, and then she's hugely she's still published and then i i spoke to douglas murray last week you know huge best-selling international best-selling 
Um, obviously, he's not woke. Um, but I suppose you could say they are untouchable, really, because they are so economically powerful. Yeah, well, I joke that, you know, if you sell two million copies, you can say what you like. If you sell 10,000 copies, you're on a, which is not a bad number, no. you're on a sticky wicket. If you sell less than that, fewer than that, then, then you, you're going to be, you know, the chances of cancellation go up uh, incredibly, which basically boils down to the publishers who claim to have these high principles about, you know, kind of progressive principles. The principles magically disappear when a certain level of numbers of sales are reached. You know, they're not going to cancel J.K. Rowling because J.K. Rowling literally is the, one of the main reasons why Bloomsbury is such a successful publisher. Mm. Um, no, and Douglas Murray sells so well, and he's so popular, but you know, ultimately the money will <laughs> speak. Yes, and yes. it's the same with Jordan Peterson, of course, yeah. where <coughs> some people at, yes, Jordan um, Peterson, yes. at, at, at Penguin, um, you know, some of the younger staff were very upset about publishing them. But funnily enough, the publisher found find that publishers find their spines when they know it's going to be a banker mm. that's going to make them huge amounts of money. Mm. And it's commercial business, you know, but I, j I just wish we, we could get, you know, it seems to me that different standards apply if to a small, but they're a small band of people. There aren't many Douglas mm. Murrays, J.K. Rowling's and Jordan Peterson's, right? They're, mm. you know, they're a very small band of people. Mm. Um, there's loads of people who do, you know, very well that, you know, either are, you know, they, they might still be, I mean, they may still be, have been published, but increasingly I'm talking to people and, and, I'm, and they're saying, well, like, I don't, it's not, I'm not madly keen on being published by people who are obviously kind of a bit embarrassed yeah, <laughs> by having yeah, me on the list. Yeah, yeah. And I say to them, well, we won't be embarrassed. We're pleased to have you on the, you know, yeah. we're, we're pleased to have you on the list. Um, you know, and, and so, you know, hence we signed up with quite a few good people already. You know, we've got books from Tony Shaw. Coming and Tony uh, Sewell, yeah, who wrote, uh, the, who wrote the race report for the government, yeah, yep. and um, Ed West, the Conservative oh, commentator, right, yeah. is, is signed up to do his next book, book with us, and uh, Danny Kruger, the Tory MP, uh, who's kind of got quite, I think, an interesting perspective on conservatism, and Mary Harrington, who um, right. is quite, if you may know her from yeah. from social media, she's, a, I think, one of them most fiercest, fierce, fiercely intelligent people, we are one of the most fiercely intelligent people on, that I know. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, you know, so we've got, we've already got quite a few people like that. And Ben Cobley, who you may, who you may be ben aware Cobley. of. Ben Cobley, oh, yes, he's been, all these people have been on the show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, there we are. So. I'll, have to, yeah. I'll have to pay more closely, uh, <laughs> close, close attention to your, who, you're, who you're interviewing so I can sign them up. <laughs> well, no, no, because, I mean, we would want all your authors on, whether they are left or right. I mean, I mean, the point is... Uh, you know, as you say, it's uh, people who just don't necessarily fit in, who might feel a bit homeless, actually. Yeah. Um, can I ask one thing? Because uh, I've been asked this by viewers in, in, in terms of publishing. This uh, phenomenon of sensitivity readers, mm. people who read through things before. <clears throat> First of all, you know, George, is it just uh, a made-up thing, or is it really there? And, and if so, how do they operate? Well, there's much more of a phenomenon in fiction publishing. Right. Um, I'm no, not aware of it in, I mean, in non-fiction publishing, it's not a, it's a different kind of kettle of fish because sensitivity, I mean, those kind of issues, if they're raised in non-fiction publishing, would be raised just by the editor in the normal process of editing the book. Um, it's, a, it's a special thing in, I think, almost exclusively in fiction publishing where you've had you know, I mean, definitely. I mean, I, I'm not an expert on fiction publishing; no. it's not my area. But I know from definitely it happens because, I mean, you know, so, so Forum is an imprint of Swift, um, is our kind of parent publisher, and we Swift has signed up Kate Clancy um, because she was dropped by a previous publisher, and Kate Clancy has written at some length on I think Unheard about how her book was basically, they attempted to basically say, it's just censorship. I mean, I, yeah, I, yeah. you can dress it up how you like, but, um, you know, it, it, can you imagine, you know, Charles Dickens or, 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 you know, Henry Fielding or whoever having a sensitivity reader? I mean, it, it's ludicrous. Um, it's a ludicrous attempt to censor the creative process, I would say. But it's not, as I said, it's not something that really comes up in non-fiction publishing. No, no, of course. I, I, yes, I can see. But in fiction, at what stage would they come in, do you think, these sensitivity readers? When it's been edited, I mean, you know, what's what stage? Well, I mean, at some stages, it's clearly being done retrospectively after after the initial. There's been some kind of some kind of bus stop or some kind of outcry, usually on social media or whatever. Mm. And then I think I don't know. I, I'm not. I don't know for a fact, but I'm, I get the strong impression that in some cases it's been happening retrospectively. But I, I'd imagine it's now happening at an earlier stage in the process. Like it's happening presumably when you the manuscript is submitted at the same stage as the editing process. Um, 
So, yeah, I mean, that, and obviously, you know, if you know you're going to have a sensitivity reader, I suppose people will start to self censor because, mm. um, but it's very difficult to self censor when, I would suggest, when you don't even know what kind of really quite innocuous mm. things are going to mm. be deemed to be unacceptable. Um, and, you know, creative people can't be self censoring them on the basis of some imagined. Um, you know, kind of per, um, um, per, uh, sensitivity reader and what they, their, their sensitivities, their, their kind of, what basically were going to amount to ideological predispositions are going to be, I would suggest. So, um, yeah, I think that's, to my best of my knowledge, that's what, that is how it works. But as I said, it's not really my area. Yes. But, um, I know we've had it on the programme a number of times. Um, she's a friend of the channel, it's actually Lionel Shriver. And, you know, she's talked, you know, very outspokenly about publishing in this sense and how it's actually going to destroy creativity if it carries on like mm. that. Um, what is your, I mean, you've got a very interesting political background, George, haven't you? I mean, you know, you, uh, you've been in publishing for seven years roughly now, mm. um, but um, you were politically active at one point, I understand, but, and yes. you've had <laughs> what they now always call a journey. Um, yes. would it, would it, is it right to say a journey or not really? Just a frustrated... Well, it's just a so I was I was a Labour councillor uh, in Cambridge, and I, I, I was Labour activist for many years, since I was fifteen. Um, and yeah, I have left the Labour Party. Um, and yeah, to a large extent, it's because I feel that the left has been moving away from what I think has uh, sound you know, the institutional left, i.e., particularly the Labour Party, not not exclusively the Labour Party, has been moving away from the kind of values that I think the Labour Party and the left should be standing for. And I mean. And the particularly, you know, I, I mean, the reason I was involved in the Labour Party was because I wanted to improve the lot of the working class and the, and, and the poor, um, in material terms, chiefly, and not solely. But um, what is your background, George? I mean, in that sense, what is your? Oh well, I, I mean, I'm kind of upper working, lower middle class mm. from Essex, and what. I mean, I don't have a particularly, uh, you know, quite a normal background, really. Mm. I mean, my parents were quite strongly left, are quite strongly left wing. Um, and you know, I was, and, and, and the kind of, but the kind of principles that my parents brought me up with haven't really changed in, um, in my mind. Like for example, when it comes to issues of race and and sexuality and so on, they, you know, they taught the things they taught me were just, you know, treat people exactly the same as you would, regardless of the colour of their skin. Just treat them like anybody else. Um, you know, or don't you know, their sexuality is not really important. It's what's important is what kind of person they are, and just treat them, uh, you know, normally. And I, I think those kind of principles have clearly. You know the raging ID politics in the Labour Party, where everyone is judged first and foremost on their not their merit, not their hard work, not their ability to contribute, but their race, their skin colour, their their gender, and so on. It just got so out of control in the Labour Party that it's like I just got. I know I mean it's not the only problem with the Labour Party, but I just and actually often this obscures the class issues. Mm. You get to a point where. You know, diversity schemes basically end up promoting kind of Nigerian princes or kind of very well-heeled ethnic minorities. Mm -hmm. where, whereas, you know, the, if you're white working class, then you're basically, you, you know, seen as, I mean, that's the last acceptable prejudice in, in, the, in this country is basically, it's basically particularly white, white working class men. They, they, they are nothing, they don't get any, you know, they are see, and, and their educational outcomes are what are the worst, literally the worst. Yeah. White working class boys, do the work do worse than any other ethnic group at school and yet you know i mean i'm not really interested in the white part of that so much as the working class part of that mm. but you can't get away from the racialization when that is the framing with the left talks about everything rather than saying you know we want to lift up working class people um who you know we want to improve their wages we want to improve their job opportunities we want to and so on it all, the labor party just can't help but, but but make it about race or about sexuality or about gender and i think it just divides people in a way which um, the, the, the labor party as it was historically the kind of Labour Party i would like to identify myself was about uniting um, people, um, mm. you know, and not just dividing the working class into ever tinier little chunks of, and we'll do this for the Muslims, and we'll do this for, you know, no, like they're just people mm. who want the same as most other people in many respects. They want a good job, they want, you know, um, if they fall on hard times, they want a safety net, they want good education for their children, they want a good NHS. And, and I just got the feeling that the Labour Party just isn't interested in those things unless it can slice and dice it into this kind of balkanized politics of, of identity. And I, I'm you know, I think a lot of people are starting to feel 
very alienated by that. And so I, I drift away from the Labour Party and I've kind of, you know, b become more and more open to what I would call kind of blue Labour. Yes, blue Labour. Blue Labour, you call yourself on, I think you refer to yourself, maybe not on Twitter, but on your website as uh, Tory socialist, right? Blue Labour, I guess you would say. Yeah, I mean... I <laughs> like Paul Embry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that... The, the, what I would say is that we have this view in this country that if you're on the left on economic issues, so you believe in trade unions and, you know, um, good wages and industrial strategy and, and, and so on, and, and, and strong public services and so on, then you have to accept a whole range of cultural positions. You have to think that trans women are women and, uh, you know, you have to be against Brexit and you have to, you know, have all these other cultural views. And I just, uh, I think that that's a very poor way of understanding things. Mm. It's perfectly possible. I mean, if you look at the history, my great heroes are the people like Ernie Bevin and Clement Attlee and people like that, who were, you know, patriots, mm. um, who believed that Britain was a great was a great country and were, you know, and, and who wanted to reform the country and bring the working class inside. Um, the institutions of the country and unite the country around, you know, if yeah. you look back, you know, I, I, wouldn't, I would like it to, there to be a situation where we had a, a, a Conservative Party and a Labour Party who were both, you know, committed to a kind of common culture, who both, you know, were patriotic, um, you know, reason, that reflected the views of the country and competed where the people actually are, rather than compete for the, you know, a, this kind of the social liberal predilections of people in in a very narrow part of the country, and I don't think the Tories are so much. I mean, I'm not joining the Conservative Party, believe me, um, because I don't. I mean, there are a few honourable exceptions in the Tory Party, but the Tories are almost no better on a lot of these issues. They seem to be chasing the vote, you know, totally misguidedly. Because even with the Red Wall, they still seem to be. That, um, you know, totally unable to reflect the views of a lot of the people who clearly voted for them in 2019. Oh, I, I would agree. I mean, that's been shameful, I would say, almost, you know, that the way that they've squandered, you know, people actually voting for them for the first time. And it was a cultural, I think it, a lot of it was a kind of cultural vote, actually. And they just are still, they still remain frightened of these issues. Uh, but obviously you were active and you wrote, as I just I did a, a um, mention there, um, a long letter, you know, sort of, a, 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 or leaving the Labour Party. And it was quite, you know, trenchant in your, in your criticism. But that means presumably that you are pretty much politically homeless, would you say, in terms of policy? Yeah, I am. Uh, I am. I feel very politically homeless. I mean, you know, I, I'm aware of the SDP and I like their ideas and... I I kind of don't have much to disagree with the SDP. I, I personally, I'm just a bit party political, you know, party politics, mm. I've, I've had my fill. Um, you know, I, I think that the SDP are going to struggle to be anything other than a kind of micro party in the current, certainly in the current system. So, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not, but I mean, you know, the thing about uh, what I would say is about, you know, I was a councillor and I saw so I did all of the knocking on doors, sorting out dog mess, um, you know, for, mm. for six six years. Uh, five, five and a half, six years, and um, you know what? That was what changed. So my politics has changed to some degree. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not just that my I've stayed the same. The Labour Party shifted. I did shift a bit because I represented a ward in Cambridge that was quite, you know, Cambridge. You think Cambridge? You think you know academics and mm. leafy suburbs and professors and so on. And obviously there is plenty of that. Don't get me wrong. But uh, I, I represented an area which still had quite a considerable kind of what you might call kind of white, you know working class, old school working class out in a, in a suburb of Cambridge. And I spent years knocking on their doors and asking them, and and you know a lot of them would, and they changed my view because you could when you if you have any kind of honesty and you really are prepared to rather than just tell them what they should think and you actually listen, you actually start thinking maybe they've got a point. You know, for example, I mean I voted Leave in the you know in the Brexit referendum, but things like the EU immigration and and, and a lot of these cultural issues. If you start to listen to people, you actually start to think actually. Maybe they've got a point, and maybe a political party whose instinctive reaction to anybody who says that something that they don't want to hear is to just, you know, like the old Brexitian line, we must dissolve the people and elect a new one. Maybe we should try to, you know, listen, or at least compromise with the electorate, <laughs> um, rather than tempt, attempt to just to tell them that they're wrong, and, you know, that they're just ignorant and they're stupid and they should listen to their betters. I mean, the Labour Party was founded by working class people mm, mm. and was founded to represent their interests and their views. And, you know, clearly, 
you know, to going to them and telling them that they're wrong on immigration. You know, I'm not saying that you have to always reflect everything that they say, but you should at least listen and, and you might find sometimes that they have a point, mm -hmm. you know, that not all wisdom lies in, you know, I mean, I say this as somebody who's a Cambridge graduate and, you know, and, and works in publishing, but you might find that, you know, it's not just people like me, or, you know, or, uh, you know, people in Westminster and people in, you know, the professions in universities, you, they might find that there is wisdom outside their very narrow mm -hmm. range of social mm -hmm. and educational mm -hmm. experiences if they just listen to people. Um, and that really, you know, so I did move, I suppose, to the, I wouldn't say to the right, I moved to be a more of a kind of communitarian who, who believes that some, you know, social institutions and structures that are already there are really important mm. and that globalisation and, you know, a, a headlong rush towards open door immigration and these things has not done there has not been in their interest it clearly hasn't been in their interest when i did one of the books i did with um uh, before my part last publisher was um the dignity of labor by john crudas mm. and he writes very movingly about he was a, a labor mp right he still is still is just down in essex uh in dagenham, dagenham. um yeah and uh, in fact i'm meeting him i'm meeting him for a drink this evening um All right. and um <laughs> Uh, he did this book called um, *The Dignity of Labour* um, with 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 me, and um, you know he writes very movingly about about Dagenham and about how you know um, basically an area which had was based on very stable working class communities based around the Ford the Ford car factory plant. It was quite socially conservative in in many ways. It was based strongly on family, on patriotism, you know, but also on trade unions and so on, um, that had a real sense of community, which was based partly on the fact that, you know, they had a co that, that they were rooted in place. This is our place. This is Dagenham. We're proud of working with our hands. We're proud of being in the union. We're proud of our, our council houses. And they were a real community and how that's been decimated by, not just by immigration, by any stretch of the imagination, but massive amounts of demographic change in that area have made it to those people almost unrecognisable. Mm -hmm. And when you add to the fact that the economic hollowing out of globalisation and so on, but the left, has, in my view, has become totally unable to criticise international capitalism, bizarrely, mm -hmm. um, because what is globalisation if it's not, and free movement of labour and free movement of capital, if that isn't, you know, headlong globalisation and, and so and, uh, you know, and in, in the movement of international capitalism. But instead, the left under new labour as well as under... You know, has embraced just embraced it because of some kind of utilitarian calculation that ultimately GDP will be higher and we can educate everybody to go to university so they can leave behind Dagenham or Wigan or you know wherever it is in the country. But people don't want to leave Wigan or Dagenham. Not everybody does want to do that. They want to live in where where they grew up. They want to mm -hmm. live in you know be able to be able to go to the live in the same area that they grew up and know know where it was. Have still have secure jobs. Still you know have you know a sense of where, who they are and place and, and stronger families and, 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 and you know, be able to see, go around the corner and see their mum or their, and, and so on. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and, but the Labour Party seems to basically, and most of the left seems to take the view that people who do want to do that, who don't want to go to university and go and work in London or something, that they're somehow you know, unambitious, the losers of globalisation and they should just be made to suck it up basically. Yeah, yeah, and I don't yeah. believe that. And I don't believe, and the Labour Party was not founded, was founded to represent the interests of those people and not you know, the interests of um, the small minority of people who manage to leave their backgrounds and, and become successful. Well, there's nothing wrong with becoming successful, but it shouldn't be a choice between you either stay in your home community and, you know, watch it rot around you and watch, you know, uh, your community fall apart or you leave it and get out. And, you know, I, I, you, people want to raise, you want to rise with your class, not not, 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 not from it and above mm. it necessarily, mm. okay. and you know. So people like you know John Cardus and Paul Embry. Paul Embry's from the same part of London originally, mm. and they they speak very movingly about this. And you know, with the Labour Party wants to get back on the conversation and start to talk to those people and not patronise them or insult them, and actually represent the true um, views and interests of ordinary working class people, then I'm happy to rejoin. <laughs> but I I'm, not the, put, I'm not putting my money on it. <laughs> I think the, the chances of that are almost zero, I would have yeah, thought. Well, that's what I concluded. <laughs> to, to, to the point where you sort of think, well, possibly I may not know what you think about this. Perhaps, like some uh, parties, political parties in Europe, Labour should actually stop me from pretending. I mean, they, they sh why don't they just actually reform themselves or rebrand themselves as a professional liberal uh, left-wing radical party. I mean, that's what they are. So you can actually present that to people, can't you? 
Well, I think they. I mean, I think they would. Find, well, I think they, they they could do. I don't think that, that they'd find it very. I mean, obviously, everything is influenced by first past the post, which means that mm. you know you have to have broad based parties in theory that can appeal widely, and therefore, I mean, you know, the, the the number of people who that would appeal to are people in cities and so on. And yeah, they clearly have an electoral base. I mean, where I'm from, Cambridge, is full of people who would vote for that kind of party. Fair enough. But if you're going to, you know, you can't become that kind of party and expect, you know, the kind of provincial working class people to just turn around and say, oh, well, you know, you're our betters, we'll just go along with whatever you say, sir. Um, of course they're not going to do that. And it would be more honest. In they probably should split into at least three parties, let's be honest. It should be a core and I far hard left party. There should be a kind of, kind of, you know, remain a middle class liberal party. And there should be like a communitarian old-fashioned, working-class, blue Labour-style party. Um, but the problem is that within the mechanics of the Labour Party's membership and activists, the last group is almost totally unrepresented. The, the, member, the activists and the, and the membership is split almost completely between the hard left and the Keir Starmer left of, you know, people who, you know, who basically wanted to ignore the, 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 the Brexit vote, who are very interested in issues of cultural diversity and stuff, but they don't... They're very uncomfortable with. Um, you know, I used to see it when I was I was a student at Cambridge, and I stayed in Cambridge. And we used to go out canvassing, and you'd get students from. You know, I was a student myself, so I'm not criticising all students, but you know, who were clearly from quite had read some books and were very, you know, very um, uh, right on kind of progressive types. And they'd go and knock on the door of council house in King's Hedges or somewhere, which is a kind of working class estate in 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 Cambridge. And the look of shock on their face as they realised that the working classes are not what some Trotskyite theorist had told them in a book that, you know, a lot of working class people are patriotic, they like the monarchy, don't worry keen on immigration necessarily, and they might have perfect, actually they might have perfectly good reasons for those views. They still might want a, you know, a well-funded NHS, they might, they want good wages, mm. they want good mm. jobs, mm. but they don't want a bunch of, you know, and basically the whole Labour Party has just become those 19 year olds knocking on doors mm. in council estates with a horrified look on their face, mm. now run the Labour Party, and they're still as horrified as ever. They see traditional Labour voters, or people who were traditional Labour voters, probably in many cases they're not, they're no, they are no longer, they, they, they see those people as embarrassing older relatives mm. who they kind of will get your vote every four years mm. but um we're not actually you know we're, you're kind of an embarrassment i wish you'd be quiet and just mm. vote for us um and then you know and of course inevitably in, the, in you know that, that that actually they did continue to vote labor despite that kind of attitude for a remarkably long time the, the working classes in britain showed or large swathes of them showed remarkable loyalty to the labor party for a long time yeah and, you know, the Labour Party under New Labour, and New Labour are also to blame, don't get me wrong. They took the, those people for granted for a very long time because they said, oh, you've got nowhere else to go. And it's like, well, I mean, that's an incredibly condescending, arrogant mm -hmm. approach to your voters mm -hmm. for a start. And secondly, in the long run, they kind of thought, actually, we do have other places to go. You know, you know, they managed to alienate those people, those loyal voters, to such an extent that they started voting Tory, or they've stopped voting altogether, or indeed they might have voted UKIP or the Brexit Party or, or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I think uh, that yes, it was always a uh, thing with the uh, UKIP, and I, I imagine as well the Brexit Party, to a lesser extent, huge part of the vote was Labour. Yeah, they, they were ex-Labour people, <laughs> and they sort of, you know, they weren't all kind of free market fundamentalists, that was the last thing they were actually. Uh, what I find interesting really is when you talk about blue Labour, George, and we've had Paul Embry on the show as well, it's basically the Labour that I remember my parents being, it's simple as that. It was just not just blue Labour, it was Labour. You yeah. know? Um, by way of sort of finishing, I mean, first of all, uh, I want to, the name of the publisher is Forum, right? Yep. Um, and basically, if you, website, if you've got a website and everything? Yes, if you just Google Forum Press. <laughs> forum um, Press. Uh, then, you know, and I, or actually, maybe Google Swift Forum Press but to make sure that you definitely get us because we are an imprint of Swift Press. I see. I see. Um, yeah, and we've got, you know, so we have one book out now, but as I said, we've got a lot of, uh, by kind of late this year and, uh, and spring next year, we're going to have, you know, increasing number of books out. And I, you know, since I was interviewed in The Telegraph, as you may have mentioned, mm. and uh, I've had, you know, I've been deluged with, with people um, emailing me and, you know, there's clearly an interest in... Uh, oh, no, I think, I think you're, you are, you're kicking at an open door. I yeah, mean, no, I'm, I'm, well, this week I've been rushing around London meeting lots of people and I've almost got so many potential authors, I can't keep up with them all. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so you know, but but you know, we are not. We I think we 
we have a rich seam of people, and as I said, not just conservatives. I'm I want I'm happy to, to, to publish conservatives and right wingers because I think they, they have valuable things to say. They have a different way of looking at the world, which we should listen to. Um, you know, but I don't just want it that it to be like that. I want people who are. You know, I don't even not necessarily left right is not necessarily the best way of thinking about it, but communitarians, mm. enlightenment liberals, classical liberals, uh, you know, socialists of various diff different descriptions, even Marxists. You know, if they've got mm. something interesting mm. to say, and sometimes they do. Um, mm. Mm. I, I want to encourage all of those people to come and you know work with Forum. Um, well, well, there you are. There's your chance. Um, I, I I wanted to just finish by asking you, um, not just things that you've. Uh, I mean, Paul Embry's book you, you, you publish. But um, if, you, if there are people watching who have always been Labour and sort of listening to what you're saying and thinking, actually, you know, that's exactly me, what books would you suggest they read? So two or three books, you know, that you would recommend, that you think are good, regardless of whether you publish them? Well, I mean, I mean, it's just going to be a kind of, uh, sort of obvious ones like David Goodhart's The Road to Somewhere, the book I published with Porty, John Cruddus's book, um, The Dignity of Labour, which I think is a great... The Dignity of Labour, John of Labor Cruddus. Is, right. a, is a great book. But I would also, I mean, I would encourage more widely um, people to read people like Christopher Lash, um, right. um, who, The Culture of Narcissism, Narcissism um, and, and who I think is, a, is now, is actually from some time ago, he wrote in the 90s, he's now dead. But he is a great um, thinker who, who really anticipated a lot of the, particularly he's, you know, with things like about how you get the, the rich become very radicalised and they become separate from the rest of the community and, and so on. He really is a great prophet, I think. So, you know, Christopher Lash, I would, I would recommend. Right. And obviously all forum books when they come out. All forum books <laughs> when they come out, great. Well, thank you very, very much, George, for joining us. And um, all the very best with it. I thank think you. you. I think you're going to have great success with it. Anyway. Well, well, let's hope so. <laughs> thank you. Um, that's it for this week. So what you're saying is we will be back next time. So uh, look forward to seeing you then. Thanks. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.